All right, thank you. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, I'll give everybody a moment to click on got it or leave meeting, whatever you decide. And all right, um, we'll go ahead and, and kick things off. Uh, first of all, I uh, we're a pretty small group, so uh, I don't have a problem if at any point people want to ask a question or do something like that, uh, because I'm gonna be in a um, different tab as I'm doing the presentation or looking at things a little bit differently, then um, you uh, may need to unmute and say something rather than just using the raise hand feature unless I'm uh, looking at Zoom and answering questions. So with that all said, uh, let me go ahead and begin. Um, so this problem about trying to secure the software supply chain um, is there's a, a few aspects you need to think about and talk about with respect to this. Um, you first of all need to talk about like, what is the software supply chain? Um, even to some degree, what does it mean to be secure? Um, what is end to end? And um, I think we all have at least a decent idea about who nation state actors are. So this is against, um, you know, really the top hackers in the world working usually for uh, governments like Russia, China, uh, Iran, uh, North Korea, the United States, Israel, others like this. So uh, hopefully out of this talk, you'll understand a bit more about the problems and challenges in this space and also um, what things are reasonable to be done. And I've been working with many different uh, students and collaborators in this space um, you know, even some of the earliest work I've done is uh, like a small part of the software supply chain uh, work. And, you know, that was, gosh, almost 20 years ago when I first started doing those types of things. Uh, so now the, you know, the problems have over time gotten more and more severe and more and more examples of these attacks. So let me dive in. Um, and first thing we need to understand to understand how to secure the software supply chain end to end and so on is what is the software supply chain? How does software actually get made in the real world? And so uh, this is a very, very, very simplistic example that's probably too simple for any widely used software, but is maybe a little more complicated than uh, people who just came out of a master's program uh, might, might have, uh, might have commonly done. So the idea is, is that you have some software that you're writing along with your collaborators, you're checking code into some kind of repository, maybe a Git repository. And then um, you're doing some testing over that. Uh, you may be testing the code before it's, it's compiled. You may be doing things like testing, uh, like doing linters and stuff like that, that look at the style of code or look for other types of, of formatting errors and things like that. Um, you also will build the software, which is for most, uh, for, for many languages, you don't ship the actual source code as, you know, for people to execute. You ship, um, you know, a compiled version of this that has libraries and dependencies and other things all linked in and installed. And you'll often do testing also over the, the things that you build. Um, these are things more like unit tests and fuzzing and, you know, black box, white box testing, all the stuff of the actual product you're executing. And then you often, you know, for software you're distributing in the real world, you have a step where you do something called packaging. I'm just going to call it packaging. That's more kind of the Linux term for it, although it's not that. Um, it's also sometimes called that in the Windows or Mac space, but it basically involves taking the actual thing you want users to run and making it so users can do things like install it, um, uninstall it, so that users have things like all the documentation for it and you know, localization related things. Like if they're in a certain country, maybe they need um, you know, certain like localization for the language of that country or things like that. And you know, in many cases, it will also either include um, some dependencies directly or include information that tells the system how to automatically get software that it is dependent on. Um, and I'll just pause for a moment and say, 
um, just in case anyone's unaware, but a, typically what, what a dependency means is if you're going to go and you're going to build a big piece of software, you'll actually use many different libraries and things from other uh, pieces of software. And um, depending on it, really the, uh, the operating systems have a favored way where they do things differently. Um, if you're using something like a uh, like a virtualized environment like Docker containers or you're on Mac, then typically when you go to build the software that you're distributing, you put all the dependencies and stuff like that into the sort of disk image that you're sending out is, is the general way that it works. If um, you're on Linux, then more typically what you do is uh, you basically say, I need to have, you know, in order to work, I need to have uh, a cryptography library and I can use this cryptography library and it can be between this version and this version. And so when you go to install software, it's very common that as you intend to install one thing, you might end up installing dozens or even in some cases like a hundred or more different packages to meet all the dependencies so that that software that you're trying to install works. And all of those pieces of software have their own uh, code repository, build process, test environment, so on, and packaging process to put their packages together. So um, this is sort of repeated over and over and over again and is um, you know, a lot more complicated than my simple diagram makes it look in practice. But when, you know, if you try to draw it all out for any even fairly simple software that's real world use, it quickly becomes unreadable. Um, but this gives you the basic idea. Okay. And historically, we've seen that there are many ways and many places in which hackers can go and break into different parts of the software supply chain. So there've been a lot of issues where people break into Git repositories or do things like set up malicious mirrors. So software that's hosted by, you know, like this is not like software you don't care about or things like this. This is major software that is like super important, like Apache web server, um, you know, like major uh, clients about this with the IP stack of things. You even had people break into the Linux source code repository and do things like this. So it's, you know, these sorts of attacks on repos happen repeatedly. Um, and it's not only repositories. Uh, there's many, many, many examples of situations where attackers have broken into build systems. In fact, one of the earliest, um, like, you know, interactions I had with large uh, open source groups was talking with folks at uh, Fedora who'd had a major hack. I wonder, sorry, I'm trying to, yeah. So I, this is, I think a pretty interest, there's a pretty interesting example where they had attackers break in and steal a bunch of credentials and, and do things like that and sign a bunch of malicious, like, like so, so the attackers were signing all these malicious packages with Fedora's key. Um, which is really bad because then any user would trust them. And um, they went and tried to do a different design to try to fix it, where what they did is they took the key and they put it in to like a hardware module on the system so that the key couldn't be taken off of the build system because it was in hardware. So um, they were broken into like six months later by someone else and that person just, rather than taking the key off and signing all the bad packages, just uploaded the bad packages they wanted to sign to the server and sign them on there. So that defense was basically useless for it. Um, because, you know, it, it's not, the problem wasn't that the key was stolen necessarily. It's that the key was, you know, could be used to sign malicious things and they didn't have good access control or security around, you know, the build server and other parts of the infrastructure. And this is actually very common. Um, a really uh, exam, you know, a big example of this that has been in the news a lot recently is related to solar winds. And 
Um, this was, I think, a wake up call for the government and elsewhere. Although this incident isn't that sort of out of character or out of line for other incidents that have happened. This is just sort of the one that um, happened to catch everybody's attention. I think it because it was a combination of a few things that usually you, you only see parts of them. One is that um, there were Russian hackers and there was a lot of evidence that it was Russia doing this. It was the US government and a bunch of their agencies that were targeted. And also it was a piece of software that was um, something that organizations were using, but wasn't, uh, how do I wanna say it? It's not like um, Google was hacked by a problem in their own code. It's that they had a vendor who made software that helped them manage like their IT infrastructure and that software was hacked. And it wasn't something that they had thought of as a point of attack. The attack itself was actually fairly clever where what hackers did is um, they broke into the build server that you see here. And um, they, what they did is as soon as it went to build uh, a version of the software, it would replace one of the source code files with a different source code file and then do a build. And then as soon as that had happened, it would clean it up. So if you looked at what was on the file system or looked at other things, everything looked normal. Everything looked like it was doing exactly what it was supposed to doing, but uh, what it was supposed to do, but secretly the server was in, the build server was in kind of a clever way uh, going and, and uh, replacing the file. And since then they've made a bunch of changes in order to do this that I'll talk about um, in a little bit. Is there a question anybody has? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there's a question, uh, not specific to solar winds, but another uh, far-reaching vulnerability called Log4j, and I posted uh, that in the chat. Um, yep. Yeah. So, so can you uh, share with us how, where, and how the Log4j vulnerability fits in in the model you have here, and, and what you might do to mitigate uh, a vulnerability like that? Right, so this is a, a dependent package that's used in different pieces of software. It's not, um, and so it, it's basically what ends up happening is users will go and install and run this as part of installing or setting up infrastructure in other ways. So I, I would I would say that you know this kind of happens as like a dependency mm -hmm. in sort of the the packaging aspect of it. Yep. Um, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I, I, I just confirm yep, what you're saying. Okay. So, uh, so really what happens is, is that, you know, as I said, this supply chain here is, um, is duplicated many times. It's basically duplicated for every single dependency. And in the case of the log4j, it isn't that so much they had like a bad guy break in or do something. It's just, they made a pretty bad mistake in their code. And because of it, um, there are a lot of other pieces of software that were vulnerable. And one of the big problems is that when you have a, a bug in a dependency, like a vulnerability, then you need everybody who's using that dependency to update their software. And that is a real issue because a lot of organizations, frankly, just don't do this. Um, there's a case where semantic, if you use Norton antivirus, so on like Norton semantic, where they were using code that was very old, very, very old versions of um, compression and decompression libraries and things like this, that they were using it, that, um, you know, the, it, you know, and, and to make it even worse, like, because hey, by the way, so if you don't know historically, libraries that do things like compression and decompression are very, very um, performance sensitive and they're also very complicated. And the combination of those two, along with the fact that they're basically always written in very low level code like C or assembly, means that historically they have a huge number of security bugs, right? Okay, and if that weren't bad enough, 
um, they're also, you know, being run in a, in the kernel. Basically, they were running like Norton was running them in the kernel. So when you had problems with them, it wasn't just that like Norton's little application would crash and have a security issue and be caught. It was that your system would blue screen or attackers would just take over your computer with, with you know, right. So updating dependencies, updating software in general is the number one thing that people should be doing in order to remain secure. Like whether you're a home user with a laptop or a smartphone or whatever, or whether you're a big company that has hundreds of software dependencies, you have to apply software updates and you have to apply them promptly because you know, even if it doesn't say it's a, a security bug fix, it you know sometimes is actually. Um, and you really need that protection because when they release the fix, especially for widely used software, it gives attackers a roadmap on how to attack that specific bug. So um, like you know, a lot of the other historical attacks like on Equifax and stuff like that, that was because they didn't patch systems. They didn't, you know, they were running an old outdated version of software and that let attackers into their systems, into their network. They had a bunch of other problems too. It wasn't like that was the only thing they did wrong. There was, you know, I could pretty much teach, I, I, you know, I teach the introductory security class and there's a whole bunch of design principles for things to do right and how to do them. And I think just from things that happened in Equifax, I could find an example of how they did every single one of them wrong in, in at least some context. Um, but it's, you know, you, you absolutely like, number one, you have to update software because you know attackers then have a roadmap of how to attack it. Um, okay, any other questions or things at this point? Professor, you have a quick question. This is Angel Saad. I am currently a cyber fellow and taking ISP uh, and I find this topic to be super interesting. So watching all your videos religiously every day, uh, thank you for making the time. So a question for you, we discussed two things, right? Log4j, which was a vulnerability that existed that people just weren't aware of. And, and then we have the solar wind situation where it was a, a, a state actor apparently that leveraged uh, perhaps lax, lax practices at the company to be able to insert themselves into their build environment to take advantage of certain things. But there are a number of companies out there that have tried to innovate around security in the open source, uh, tech stack, et cetera. Where are the limitations in terms of what companies are doing already to be able to, to fix some of these inherent challenges uh, that are beyond what you know, good security policies and implementation of those policies would be able to help them with? Um, so one thing that most, uh, we're going to kind of come to this later. One thing most organizations do is, um, I, I will say there's a little bit of a herd mentality. It's like, uh, and I will say that few companies, everyone wants to be in the pack, maybe at the middle or a little ahead, but people don't want to be at the front of the pack because um, there's like, you know, there's like learning pains and things like this. Some companies do, and they use it as kind of a PR thing, but you you kind of have to get to the point where um, it's being pushed and used by lots of organizations because then when you're, you know, the CISO or CTO or whoever goes and argues that this company should do it, they're not really stepping out on a, on a limb if like Microsoft and Google are already doing it, for instance. Um, if they're going to be the first one to try, you know, to use some technique or deploy something, then that is a bit different. And so I think there's um, a little bit of fear of moving too fast in this space. And a lot of companies, frankly, don't have the talent or the awareness to, um, you know, like to, to know where they are and to move themselves into a good spot and have just not prioritized 
security and so are sort of way behind. So Equifax definitely falls into that category. And from a lot of the public information about solar winds, I'm not saying that they did a great job or anything, but it, it doesn't feel like they had massive, egregious, horrible practices or things like this. Um, it, it feels like, you know, it, you know, you kind of have to, to look and see to understand, um, you know, and, and that would require a much more detailed analysis of documents that aren't public to understand if they were doing mostly the right things, if they were doing bad things and so on. So it's not something that, you know, those with knowledge of just public information um, can say. I, I will talk about steps people can take and I will try to show you where, you know, I talk a little bit about what is closer to the bleeding edge, but also a lot of the things that were bleeding edge like two years ago are now have fought like, you know, the, the front runners in the pack are all doing those types of things now. And I can kind of talk about like how to get there and other efforts that are going on. Okay, so let me move ahead and let's talk about packaging and stuff like this. So once you get your software, you put it together, you have a list of dependencies and things, um, you typically stick it up on some server or repository or something. And I remember it not that long ago, probably six or seven years ago, having a conversation with one of the big five tech companies and trying to convince them that um, just having stuff up on a server where the only authentication was HTTPS with their, you know, sort like certificate checking was bad. And I could not convince them that this was a problem. And then they actually had, you know, users compromised because of flaws and issues related to this. But in general, um, it happens many times that you can break into the server where they're storing these types of things. You can go and um, there historically have been a whole bunch of issues and vulnerabilities and weaknesses in uh, if you use, if you just rely on like um, uh, TLS, if you just rely on that, then uh, you're very likely to have lots of issues. And when I've worked with companies both publicly and like under NDA, I've urged them that, you know, X509 certificates, things like this are very complicated to get a lot of the corner cases right. And so I see, I've seen time and time again, whether, you know, like a lot of these organizations make a mistake of relying on very complicated code in a very trusted way and then uh, being vulnerable to it. So for instance, like Apple has a really, really good security track record overall, just very strong. And um, they also have been like a front runner in terms of building hardware-based security into um, their, their laptops and phones and things like this and so on. And one area that I think was a mistake was that they use X509 certificates under the hood for a lot of this. And actually, I think nearly all of the really serious issues they've had that have been hardware-based have been with the fact that they're using X509 certificates because it's, it's very complicated to get that, all that logic correct. And they could, they don't need most of what that does. They don't need most of the, the logic there and things, but they kind of are beholden to the way that it works. So you have to be um, sort of aware of that. Uh, from a testing standpoint, there also are a lot of issues around, you know, are you running the right tests? Are you, act, did you actually run the tests? And this doesn't have to be, you know, a um, like malicious uh, hacker from another country breaking in. It's not uncommon that, you know, it takes like an hour to run the tests and the developers have been working a long time and they're just freaking tired. And it's like, you know, this has got to be good. I just fixed the small thing. I just reverted this one little change. Everything's going to be fine. I don't want to wait around. Push to production, right? And it turns out that one little thing had some unintended consequence that, you know, everything breaks or 
you know, other situations like that are actually fairly common. So um, there was a really interesting example where Microsoft a while ago pushed a Windows update out to, and it has a bunch, it has like a, a sort of a distributed network of servers, like as part of a CDN that serves the updates. And this update um, only got pushed to a few of those servers. And those servers were in countries uh, like Kazakhstan that had like a horrible record of human rights abuse by the government there and spying. And so um, the fact that there was an update that was only pushed to a few authoritarian countries seemed extremely suspicious to people. And there was a lot of discussion about this. And Microsoft said, oh no, it was just an error. We didn't even mean to push this at all. And you know, when we went to try to stop it, it had already gone a few places and it just happened to go to those, right? And um, just to, you know, sort of make their story a little more plausible, I guess, like a few weeks later, they did the same thing, but it went to a different set of countries. So, I mean, it is possible that that is a decent, that, that that actually happened. And it's not just Microsoft that's done this. Apple has accidentally pushed out updates. Other organizations have done it too. So it's, it's not an uncommon occurrence. Um, and, you know, Microsoft, it's not like Microsoft's only done it twice or something. It, it probably happens, you know, um, you know, for them, like every other year or more, more frequently in some cases for things like their operating system. So I hope I've convinced you that attackers are able to hack basically all of the software supply chain. There's weaknesses everywhere, potentially, right? And if you think about things from a security standpoint, what you really should be thinking about isn't how do I make things secure? It's how do I make them more secure? Okay. Because it's a little bit like it's risk management is basically what you're doing. And, you know, it's, it's like saying, you know, you would never say like, how do I make it so that my car cannot break down? Right, because there's always something that could happen, right? But by, you know, um, you know, replacing your brake pads and by, you know, um, uh, rotating your tires and doing regular maintenance and all these other things you're supposed to do, you make it less likely to do it. And also, you know, you have to decide how do I best spend my money. You know, do I get um, like bulletproof tires and nail-proof tires for my car? Or something like that, just in case of that. Or you know, would I be better off, you know, spending that money to get, you know, a tune-up, an exhaust, lube, whatever, check over, right? So it's exactly the same way with this. Um, all right. So now there's a question about how can we fix this? Are there things we can do to try to fix this? And there are actually a lot of really good point solutions, some of which have, that have existed for many years. So um, there's actually work on signing Git commits and doing things like this and signing things for CVS and so on. And myself and uh, one of my former PhD students who's now a professor at Purdue actually um, came, found a bunch of flaws in the way that that was being done inside of Git. And we have a design that's now used inside of Git uh, that if you go and you sign your Git tags, you're actually using my student's code and our design that we came up with that helps to protect Git signing. Um, so, you know, you can do things like make that part of it harder to, to attack. Um, where before we showed that even if everybody was signing things, there were ways that you could sort of be a malicious Git repository and cause uh, malicious commits to, uh, or sorry, to cause like buggy commits and things like that to end up in master without people being able to realize what was going on. Uh, now, uh, build part of the system is also really, really important to secure. And this is where SolarWinds, for instance, was hacked. And like Biden's executive order focuses on the whole supply chain, but I think pays a little more attention to the build part of the process. And there are things you can do. As I said, I don't think that having uh, like keeping the keys and hardware on the build server. It's certainly not a be all end all. It's a, I think a pretty weak security step, but it's one that is very easy to do. So a lot of organizations do it because it's, it's um, 
sort of low, um, you know, effort to integrate, but I don't think it actually buys you very much. Um, there are, what is more common is there's an effort called reproducible builds. And this is starting to become more of the, you know, kind of going from the bleeding edge to just the, you know, leading the pack, like the, you know, the front runners in the pack are doing it where what they'll do is they'll have independent build setups that they run that are independently managed and often will do things like maybe even have different versions of like different operating systems or versions of things or stuff like this on them. And then they will build the software and then compare to make sure that those pieces of software that are built are actually the same, um, which it actually requires more work than you would think but a lot of major distributions, Linux distributions, already have um, you know most of their packages building on uh, in a reproducible way, uh, and uh, organizations like SolarWinds and others are now doing reproducible builds all the time as they go to build their software. Um, and then there's packaging. So if you want to distribute your software and get it out there. You have a few different options. Um, I very, very, very strongly suggest not just using TLS and trusting TLS. Um, this is a trap that it kind of still blows my mind that, you know, like it, it blew my mind in 2010 that people were falling for this, that I thought this was a good idea. And it blows my mind that occasionally people still think it's a good idea now. Although most, most of the time, I think most people have kind of moved on. So there's, there's big efforts um, to do other things. Like don't, don't just do TLS or GPG signing. They don't um, provide you the, they don't provide you with a lot of what you need, including like resilience against compromise and so on, which is really common and often what happens in this case. So um, we built a system called Tough that uh, I'll skip over this. Looks complicated. This is a really outdated list of organizations. I should have updated this slide. I'm sorry about this. But um, Tough is actually in. It's a Linux Foundation project. It's used by the, or it's hosted by um, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and it's super widely used in the cloud. Um, you know, like uh, Microsoft, Amazon, um, IBM, uh, Docker, uh, you know, Python, uh, you know, and all the companies you see up here, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting quite a few, but it's, it's basically, you know, distributed and used as a way to secure software. The CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has three levels of projects. And at the top level, are the most mature projects, things like Kubernetes and Containerd and stuff like this that are sort of like, you know, pervasively used and, and important. And uh, Tough is at that level. So it's uh, something that's used and to protect a lot of these organizations, you know, a lot of organizations. And we've been very fortunate to have developers, uh, you know, teams from different major tech companies, um, you know, IBM, uh, Google, VMware, uh, Microsoft, and others all build implementations of Tough, and in most cases, they just open source them. So there's multiple different implementations that have many, many users that are all available for free uh, linked off our site. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear you very well. Hello? Was there a question? All right, I will uh, move on then. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's also like uh, an automotive variant of it that's standardized by IEEE ISTO and also um, um, the JDF, the, which is like a path to the, um, 
yeah, to the ISO standardization stuff like this. Anyway, um, but yeah, it's it's used by major automakers and and stuff like this. Um, we actually don't know too much about how widely Uptane is really used in practice because the automakers are super secretive. But um, we've had a lot of participation from different uh, groups there, and and have had people you know do demos. Uh, for us and stuff like that uh, from major automakers. So um, I, I think if you look on the site, you can see the names of a few organizations that have officially joined, although uh, most of them are afraid to do so and are sort of saying like, yeah, we are, you know, so anyway. Um, okay, so given we have all these point solutions, the next natural question is like, have we fixed it? Let's say that you go and you use um, you know, you use tough, you use, um, uh, you know, get signing, you do reproducible builds. Um, is that good enough? And the answer is no, it's not actually. And the reason why is because in the end, you not only need to do the right things, but you need to be able to verify that you've done the right things. And you need to be able to verify you've done the right things when a, an attacker might want to lie about it. So in other words, um, how do you know that all the code, oops, sorry about that. How do you know that all the code you signed and did things with um, is the code that's going into the build process? And how do you know the code that came out of the build process is the code that's going into being packaged? And how do you know that that code was the code that was tested? And how do you do that in scenarios where an attacker might want to tamper with this, okay? Um, so what we want to do is have end-to-end -end security. We want to end-to-end -end secure the entire thing. And we want to do it in a way that's verifiable, where basically um, there's a way for independent observers or people to verify that things were actually done and verify that the right things were done and other things, you know, wrong things weren't also done. So we want to guarantee if you say that this piece of software, this binary is only supposed to contain code uh, you know, that was compiled with this compiler and the source code has to, has to be this coming in and so on. That is exactly what should come out. There shouldn't be things missing. There shouldn't be things changed. There shouldn't be things added. It should be exactly what you say, right? And it should be ver cryptographically verifiable where, you know, unless someone steals a, a, sign a signing key or something, you know you're secure. And if, you know, yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, move on. So the way we do this is we have um, built a system called Intoto. Uh, and Intoto has something called a layout. The layout basically describes what the software supply chain looks like. And it has a series of steps that say, these are the things that you do to build your software. It also has what are called functionaries. And functionaries are, um, the basically it's the key that's trusted to do the action. So if you have things like developers, the, de the key will correspond directly to a developer. If you have something like a build server, the build server itself might contain that key. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then what happens is, is that as you perform actions in the system, as you go and you take, you know, code out of the version control system and pass it to the build server and so on, um, you create uh information about that process these are called materials and products so basically materials are things that you take in and products are things that you produce and we don't call this input and output because it gets confusing when you talk about like a tests input and output um whether you mean the actual things that would display on the screen for the test or so on versus the actual you know files that went in you know, that were used to run the test and the, um, you know, the resulting files, if, if for instance, in some cases, um, 
some types of testing infrastructure that do more um, CI/CD, if you know that term, will actually combine steps and may modify files intentionally as part of that process. So in other words, um, these materials and products are the things that say, like, this is what's supposed to come in and come out. And then there's rules that say things like, for instance, um, Dave, who's doing a test here, the materials that Dave uses, the thing Dave is doing a test over is the, is the latest like tagged version from the Git repository. And that's the same version that Carol is supposed to be building. And after Carol builds it, then that version is the one that Aaron is supposed to be packaging. And so it like links everything together in that way. Okay. And the layout itself is signed by the project owner, in this case, Alice, um, to say, this is how my software is made. And you, you do this um, when you set things up. And if you make a, you know, a substantial change, like if you um, decide that you're changing your build system, you, let's say you're going to do reproducible builds. So you have two different build servers here that build things and then their materials uh, and products have to agree and so on. Um, then you would modify your layout. But in general, you create this and then usually you can just go and build your software for months or whatever and not have to change your layout. Um, does that make sense? Okay, I'll just assume it does. And then what happens is, is as the functionaries run, uh, they uh, create like signed evidence. They create cryptographically signed evidence for every step they do. Um, and then in the end, when you go to verify it, you end up with the package you're going to verify. You end up with this layout file and you end up with these pieces of uh, link metadata. And then you're able to do a very straightforward, uh, basically you're automatically able to take this and verify that the link files match what's required in the layout. Um, so I'm going to skip through this because I, don't think the nuts and bolts are that interesting and I want to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, so, but at a high level, I want to make sure that at least it's clear um, at a high level, um, all you're doing is taking information about the steps that happened when you built the software and verifying it in a way using uh, these signed things. And unless an attacker has stolen a key or has broken into a system, um, they will not be able to do anything that could possibly be trusted. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute, attackers like in SolarWinds were able to steal keys and do things. So why, you know, and I'll just say SolarWinds is using in Toto as are lots of other organizations, like thousands of others. But the real advantage you have here are, is, a, is a few. So one, if you do something like reproducible builds, um, you have the, you, you need to verify that the two systems built the same thing, right? And how do you do that? So if the way you do it is you just have some box that just looks at the result of the two and says, yep, they were the same, then that box becomes a single point of failure in your system. So in Toto, the way that would work is in, in Toto, there'd be two different Carol's here. There'd be a, you know, Carol and um, I don't know, Charlize or something. And they each would create signed metadata about what they received in and out. Okay. And then those pieces of signed metadata would get checked when you go to install it and they would have to match. So you'd have to compromise both systems with something like in Toto. Whereas when you have the system that just does the checking and then says everything's okay, you can literally just compromise that one system and then not even use the build output of either part of reproducible builds, right? So it doesn't really solve the problem. You still, if you don't have something like this cryptographic verification, you're still going to end up with situations where the compromise of a single box or a single key or something is catastrophic in, in the system. Um, I will also say that um, things like the layout, which uh, is uh, more critical to the security of Intoto, um, those keys can be kept fully offline. So with things like Tuff, 
the way that people manage keys and stuff like this is typically there's a couple of keys that are on the server that if they're compromised are very, very low impact. They have, you know, the type of thing you could do is maybe lie to somebody and say, you know, there hasn't been an update in the last hour, even though there really has been one, if you compromise one of those keys. But they won't let you say something like, this is a valid version of this software, okay? And those more sensitive keys that have sort of higher ability to do things need to be used less frequently and in uh, tough and tough like systems are uh, typically stored offline. So it's very common that, you know, there's uh, a set of keys where, you know, there's five different people that each have a Yubi key that's in a safety deposit box or a safe, you know, in the office or something that they pull out every six months uh, to renew it, or they have to pull out when there's some kind of uh, major security incident. But other than that, it's not, um, you know, is, isn't needed to be used on a daily or weekly or even, you know, any, you know, monthly basis, something like that. Um, which, you know, that model seems to work very well for organizations is, you know, have a, have a fail safe like that if you need it, but, you know, don't make users have to do complicated things um, frequently, that things that could impact their security frequently. Okay, so that all being said, um, I mentioned this before, but in Toto's, been integrated and used lots of places. Um, SolarWinds, uh, Datadog, um, Grafeus, which is a Google project, Jenkins, GitLab, so on. Um, it's being pushed a lot by, um, I don't know if you've heard of SigStore and the efforts and things like this behind this, but it's uh, pushed and used a lot in SigStore, which uh, both Microsoft and Google are really, really uh, pushing hard. And uh, so, um, the nice thing about this project is that the security aspect of this meta, you know, of worrying about software supply chains and things um, seems th there's really not a lot that's happened in that part of the space. And so um, as other people come along with like S bombs, for instance, is a popular term, a popular uh, way to store information about things. S bomb storage um, usually is done, it usually is secured using Intoto. And things like this. So we've sort of been able to um, slot in and work with and provide security infrastructure for a lot of the um, different things you might hear about in the space. Uh, and so I'll, you know, just kind of quickly summarize here. So it's really important to not to actually secure your software supply chain to move it towards security, right? You're never going to be perfectly secure, but you want to get to a point where um, you have done acceptable, reasonable things. And um, SolarWinds and Datadog have published a lot of public information about their integrations and how they've gone and where they thought they got value. Um, if you're looking for case studies and things like that, a lot of other organizations that have used it have been more private, but uh, they've been at the both been at kind of closer to the forefront. Uh, SolarWinds post compromise, not pre compromise, but after the compromise, they decided they wanted to try to be bleeding, you know, closer to bleeding edge, and so really moved uh, forward with that and a lot of initiatives. Uh, Intoto is also a Linux foundation, uh, also in the CNCF, the same as Tuff. Um, Intoto is not at the highest level of maturity; it's at the second highest level of maturity, um, but is widely used in industry. And I think in the next year or two, I would expect it'll be mature enough to move up to the highest level. And it is really the first tool and I, I'm not aware of anything else that really does end-to-end -end cryptographic verification in the software supply chain space. Um, so it, it's really the, you know, the only thing out there that might actually get you to a reasonable security level. Um, one other thing I'll say about it is this design with the materials and the products and the way that we encode things and do things, um, it's very, uh, subtle, it's very subtle and very tricky to get it right. And I actually, with my student, we worked for about nine months where literally every week he would come into my office with a slight tweak on a design. And we had uh, layouts from large popular uh, software projects that we had managed to get from people we've been working with and went through tons and tons of examples to try, try to figure out like, well, what if we 
um, encode, you know, what if we do this this way, do this that way? And what we ended up with is something that, you know, takes advantage of us spending a lot of time and working a lot through these cases. And so um, I, I would urge you not to try to reinvent a wheel that looks almost identical because um, we'll probably immediately be able to point out why it's wrong or like how it will fail. Um, and, you know, it will, it might take you, you know, a little, you know, like months or so to figure that out, but hackers will also figure it out at some point too. So um, because of this kind of process and things, we've had a, a ton of adoption and uptake and, you know, prevented uh, sort of this area from splintering too much. So it's all, uh, like I said, it's all open source. Um, there's implementations and things like that available on the site. You can come to our community meetings, which have about, you know, 30 or so participants from, uh, I don't know, 15 or so organizations usually. Um, you know, everything from embedded systems to automotive to, um, you know, people at major cloud providers to, you know, whatever, yeah, just all over the place, Linux distributions, um, you know, all kind of participate and, and use and do things within Toto in different ways. So um, with that, I, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any more questions. Uh, I, I have a, one more question. It's um, a little away from pure supply chain, but still relates to building software in because clearly if you build it in, um, it, it's less uh, costly um, and, and certainly less of an impact um, in, in talking about breach vulnerability. Um, <clears throat> there's the tools in the test environment. So any thoughts around some of the tools that I have uh, sort of uh, pointed out in the in the chat there? So, so, so now you're just looking not so much at the process to get from uh, compiled code out the door for, for the user, but making sure that that code in and of itself is, um, is secure. Yeah, um, so it depends a lot on what you're doing. Um, if you're running, um, like, so if you're writing a lot of uh, low level code in an unsafe language like C, then fuzzing is super important. Mm -hmm. And doing a bunch of work with that is really key. Um, if you're writing code that's very critical in uh, running in kernel space or doing things like that, then you probably are going to do more verification and static analysis and so on. Yep. Uh, in general, most of the time, you tend to do quite a lot of um, sort of dynamic testing regardless yep. of, of the language or the environment. Um, and there's different ways to do it. But, it, you know, kind of going back to this, if you just ask the question, you know, how should you test? It's like, well, if you're in a cloud environment, you might use A-B testing in this way and do this and that. But if you're on, you know, mobile, you'll write, you know, you'll do, do things quite differently. So um, I think it really depends on so many other variables that I can't um, just give you a blanket answer. Oh, oh, um, I yeah. I was going to say, I think you've given me a fine answer uh, thus far. I mean, um, I, I sort of appreciate what you do. And, and there's a metric out there that speaks to the vulnerabilities per thousand lines of code or the percentages. And it seems like there's about a good 2% or so to so two, two round two to three, maybe 4% of code, application code that's, that's, that's quote, vulnerable, the, the vulnerabilities. And, and I just like to see that number get down to zero. Because uh, two to three percent, even on, uh, I mean, the numbers of lines of code now are just astronomical and they'll only continue to grow. And so I was looking at that test environment and trying to catch those before they even make it into a production environment along that process you were sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, there's different things you can try to do in that regard. Um, a lot of it depends on things like the language, though, too. Yeah. And it depends on the libraries you use and other things. In yep. fact, most vulnerabilities are in dependencies historically overall. Yep. So, um, you know, it, you're, testing your code is really important, but being really aware of the code you bring in 
mm -hmm. and use is is equally or maybe even slightly more important. Well, log four J, right? I mean, we just <laughs> we're right back there. Yep. Thank you so much uh, so, for the presentation. Sure, no problem. So, Joel, um, I, I think SBOM is great, uh, but SBOM is like the collection of the information, uh, but doesn't really validate that that information is accurate in a in a reasonable way. So um, that's why people use things like Intoto with uh, SBOM to try to protect it and to try to provide validation that the information you're getting is trustworthy. It's a little bit like, um, I don't have anything here with me, but you know, if I have a box of cereal and it has a list of ingredients on the side, um, you know, if you don't have any reason to know that that's actually the list of ingredients, if there's no enforcement or verification, then it's better than not having it, but is probably not uh, what, you, what you actually want. You'd rather have some way to verify that these are the actual ingredients. Well, uh, Justin, you might want to add in there that, okay, you know the ingredients, and I think, again, that's important, that's a very good step, but you don't know which one is actually a bit more toxic than less so. That, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean. I, that, that's, that's a good point, especially with dependencies and things, and what I believe will happen over time is as more, right now, most of the time that information just isn't public at all. Right. I mean, we're kind of back in the days of, you know, by like Dr. Kapos's magical medicine elixir, right? right, right? right. That's, that's basically where we are with software. And um, we need to get to the point where there are at least labels saying what's in it. And once we get to that point, then people will start to say, wait a minute, what do you mean that there's like arsenic in this? Right, that's right. And then once that happens, then we'll start to see those things go out of use. But right now, um, you know, everything and everybody is basically hiding what they're having, at least in a large part of the software industry. And yeah. so once things open up, I think everybody will have to have better practices overall. Yeah. So, so the point is we're going in the right direction. I mean, I mean it's a journey. And um, if, if yeah. uh, people move to SBOMs, especially if they move to things, you know, that are verifiable, because I don't really want to be I'd rather have everybody move to something secure now and solve that problem too, like yeah. it's verified, rather than have to nag people to actually verify that the stuff is correct for the next 20 years. Um, but assuming we move to that step, then we're moving in the right direction. And I think with Biden's executive order, yes. I think government agencies will force people to move that direction. And as they force some people to move that direction, it'll have a sort of a domino effect because um, you use software from other places and hey, you know, my software might be okay I do in house, but if I'm using a bad dependency, then yeah. So I, I think it will have a ripple effect and people will fix more and more things and then it will just be more common to do it the right way. Well, that's an excellent point. And I think then too, that um, if, if you go to do audits and, and, and things of that nature, that you'll, you'll begin looking as part of your risk management processes uh, to, to, to help identify, hey, wait a minute, you've, you've got some things here that just aren't lining up. So excellent points. Excellent. Brilliant presentation. Professor, I have a, another comment. Uh, so my full-time job has been a deep tech venture capital investor for some time. And uh, the whole S-bomb thing has caught my attention. And in a lot of my conversations with many of the CISOs, but also the startups that are looking to build, products for that it seems to me that they're still very superficial solutions because like you mentioned you're just i mean literally it is a bill of materials it's just for software but there's not i haven't seen many things that that really make this document become alive uh, and it's very easy for these things to just become stagnant and my biggest fear is that people will start adopting the, the whole s-bomb thing in a manner that is not very sophisticated or intelligent and we'll find ourselves in the same problem in a year or two years, because now they're trying to build some uh, uh, some dynamic aspects into this S bomb uh, document, uh, and then it'll be starting again from scratch. For what you've built within Toto, is it already? I mean, you mentioned it's already integrated into many of the other um, software or tools that people are using. How easy would it be to integrate into on the back end into an S bomb 
uh, depending on whatever that future standard would be? Or what are some of the other ways in which you are thinking about making Intoto more useful for the folks that are looking at it from the organizational standpoint, as opposed to just the technology and engineering standpoint, particularly when you think about the heterogeneous uh, sources of where the code is coming from. Uh, sometimes it's all built in house, right. but even the companies that build things in house have a really difficult time understanding what code they have in their stack. Uh, and it's incredibly more complex when you start thinking about uh, outsourcing different pieces of, of the entire software puzzle. Right. Okay. So yeah, there's a couple different points in there. I want to make sure I don't kind of lose them all. So one thing I, I didn't really talk too much about with Intoto is um, you can use it to sign pretty much anything, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, I think it's, you know, the, the good part about signing anything is that literally if um, you're worried about the fact that your developer might have their laptop in front of them and they might step away for a second and someone might reach over and press keys on the keypad to complete it, you know, to add code in or something like it. And because you're worried about that, you put fingerprint readers on every key on the keyboard to make sure it authenticates that. Intoto can capture that information. You know, you can put that in Intoto and Intoto can verify that for you right now, today, right? And, it, you know, if, you know, if the next thing that comes after that is that people then can, I don't know, hypnotize them through the screen and cause the developer to push the keys. So you have to read their brain waves and there's a way to verify that their brain waves weren't, you know, they weren't hypnotized. And Toto can, can deal with that information too. But the downside of that is, because Intoto is agno agnostic to what it's, what the information is that it's verifying. It just knows like, you're telling me this is how I verify this thing. And then you're telling me whether it succeeded or failed. And so you can put something like just a whole S bomb in and say, oh, my whole S bomb that just sort of I made up, you know, in a Word document on my laptop is the S bomb for my materials. And I'm sticking it in in Toto. And the verification is that the file exists. Right. And so then you're kind of garbage in, garbage out with that. Right. Uh, because you don't know that the information in the S bomb is accurate. And actually, I share your skepticism. I haven't, I really wish I'd seen more like startups doing something that was actually not, didn't seem to be just selling you a box that they claim will solve your problems and basically just stores like shady, you know, really shady provenance sourced uh, information for S bombs and things like that. Um, but the, the way to get around this is you really, it's hard to outsource. You basically need to, in a layout, accurately describe what you're doing. And you need to have those systems generate metadata that you can then cryptographically verify and make it, you know, so that everything works. So I think you need almost more of like a services model where, you know, you're hiring the person to come in and clean your office. You're not like, you know, buying a, uh, a box that's going to somehow do it. Like, I don't know, you know, it's, it's not a, um, yeah. So, uh, and, and to be honest, it's also something where, um, most of the information about how your supply chain works and things is all things that you and your developers know and need to expose. So it's, it's sort of like, you just have to write this down in a good way. And we've been working with things related to in Toto to try to make that easier and easier for people. And our experience has been that, you know, if people know what their supply chain is, it actually only takes like a few hours to get everything set up within Toto end to end. And then you're just done forever, basically, unless you're, unless your process changes, unless you have a new build farm or you have a new testing environment or something, you're good. Um, the harder parts are when people don't know where anything is coming from or what's happening or whatever like that, which is surprisingly often. And that alone is like a red flag. It's like, if you didn't know that all the stuff was going into your, your binary or where it came from, or, oh, you know, there's this library that someone downloaded using wget, you know, over HTTP, you know, like eight years ago that we've just been building into our code because it was for this, you know, component that we never really look at. Um, in total, we'll, you know, you'll know that that all happens now. 
And, um, you know, you, you know, you may decide you want to make some changes as a result of that. So, um, yeah, uh, I think I answered part of your question. I wonder if I missed something else. No, no, it's good. I mean, I, I'm a new student and I plan to follow up with you in the secure systems lab and all that stuff. And this was an awesome introduction into what you guys have been up to with respect to Intoto. And I'm really uh, eager to explore some of the other things that you guys have been working on that seem really interesting. Great. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, Alexandra, do you have any other what announcements? Like who's the next speaker? When's the yes, next speaker? thank you, Justin, for your presentation. And we thank all of our alumni for participating this afternoon. Please consider joining us on September 21st at noon for a conversation with recent cyber fellow, Michael Leaking, Business Information Security Officer at US Bank. This concludes our program and we wish everyone a wonderful day. <laughs>